Well, good morning. Again, I'm Father Mike Leiden from uh, Bishop DeBerg High School, where I've been for 21 years. This is my second tour of duty, and two of them. And I've been a, father, a friend of Father Gary since almost 40 years, I think. We went to a trip to the Holy Land uh, in January of 1980 with several seminarians and priests. And uh, we've remained friends since then. Um, his enthusiasm for life and his faith his constancy and friendship, certainly for me and others, his asking hard gospel questions, and the insightful capacity he has to connect the gospel to daily life, really edify me and lift me up as a brother priest and Christian and human being. His affection is contagious, as is his enthusiasm, and I'm very grateful for his friendship and brotherhood and faith and priesthood. You are blessed to have him here as your pastor, preacher, and priest. He asked me to substitute for him this weekend because he wanted to get away. <laughs> oh, does he ever leave? <laughs> and partly because I was formed in faith as a young adult at the Newman Center at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. It's not an exaggeration to say that the Newman Center there in my friendship with Father Bill Lyons saved my life and kept me in the Catholic Church when I was in my early 20s. I had strayed from faith in Christ and the Church throughout my teens and early 20s. I was a uh, searching agnostic at best when I met Bill Lyons as a student at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. And around that same time, as I guess Providence would have it, my sister got involved with the charismatic Pentecostal prayer group, which eventually became a huge megachurch out in Maryland Heights called Grace World Outreach. Through their ministry, the Holy Spirit renewed my life and convinced me, as was said earlier, of the reality of God's unconditional love. And palpably, I felt the forgiveness of my sins, and it gave me a fervent desire to know Christ in the scriptures and through prayer. But being Catholic all my life and being at UMSL, I walked across the street and I met the Newman Center there, especially through the person of Bill Lyons, but got to know the community there and eventually became a campus minister there. And then I rekindled a call to priesthood to me that's been in my life since grade school. But I've learned over the long haul that the spiritual journey is really never over. And as wonderful as a baptism in the Holy Spirit is, feeling the presence of God very powerfully. It's really just an initiation that sparks the longer journey. Because wounds from childhood and family reemerge at different stages in life. And tenaciously bad habits just seem to hang on. Some of them addictions. And selfishness in different areas of one's life are extremely difficult to overcome. Furthermore, it's not really our call. God cannot be controlled, manipulated, or tamed. And you cannot deceive God. He cannot abide in duplicity. As recovering 12-step people like to say, God is God and we are not. Most of us have to learn that truth over and over again. Now surely one of the most difficult issues in life is when innocent people suffer, sometimes randomly, or intensely, or in a prolonged fashion. Our scriptures take on that human experience full force today. Are we ready to hear and heed the message? The translation here is rather harsh. From Isaiah, the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. Did you hear that? Another translation says, but it was the Lord's will to crush him with pain by making his life as a reparation offering. Now this scripture is taken from the longer Isaiah 52, 53 scripture, which comes to us every first reading at Good Friday. It describes a suffering servant whom God has apparently abandoned, but then again, no. The servant is not abandoned, but serving a higher purpose. And in this suffering, the servant is justifying many. That is, the servant is bringing into right relationship with God precisely through 
the mystery of that suffering. And early Christians clearly understood this Isaiah passage to believe it was Christ that he was prophesying about. And upon closer reading, you can see why if you read the whole passage. And also Psalm 22, which comes to us again at Good Friday. It prophesies one abandoned and crucified. Mysteriously, Jesus' suffering takes away our sins and makes us right with God. And this Isaiah passage is paired deliberately by the church and the liturgy to coincide with Jesus' question to James and John, can you drink of the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they confidently answer, we can, and they miserably fail, as do all the apostles and disciples, running away, denying him, and betraying him. Jesus asked that question of each one of us today. Can you drink the cup that I drink of or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Even when pain comes unbidden and suffering is undeserved, this week Christ calls us to understand and use our suffering, if you will, in a different light. For even undeserved suffering, born with bravery and perseverance, is redemptive for us and evangelical for others. Let me explain. Recently in the parish where I live, a 50-year-old man with a wife and four children in high school and college was struck down by a heart attack and died very quickly thereafter. The man was one of the most generous and cheerful stewards in the parish, volunteering for all kinds of stuff. The pastor used to say of him, he's the kind of parishioner pastors salivate over. <laughs> Low maintenance and giving all the time. You know, trivia night, picnic, the nitty gritty stuff of parish life. Boom, gone. Of course, his wife was bereft and his children deeply saddened. His funeral was a parish event packed with about 800 people at St. George Church in Afton. More than Christmas. A few weeks after that, I called his wife and asked her how she was doing. And of course, she started to cry saying that she was still devastated by his death. But after a while, she told me this. You know, people ask me if I am mad at God for taking him. But I'm not mad at God. Very puzzled and very sad, but not mad. Jim had 50 good years, and I got to share over half of them with him. I believe God has a plan and I will gradually learn it as my life goes on. I am grateful for Jim's and my life together. I am sure God knows what he is doing. I just don't know it yet. For me, this is a time for trust. I was astounded and edified and called to conversion all at once. I guess I've grown used to the anger and rage so present in our culture and in me. And I was expecting her to express some of that. By her very words, I was called to a deeper faith in Christ and reminded that my suffering is mostly minor inconveniences and discomforts and consequences from my own sinful or improper actions. Her words challenged me to see suffering humbly and with patience. God knows what he's doing, she said. I just don't know it yet. And her rare attitude of trust called me to confess my sins of ingratitude, personal entitlements, lack of trust, outbursts of anger and rage, hyper-competitiveness, among many others. So can we drink of the cup that Christ drinks of? Can we be baptized in the baptism of grief, of pain, of betrayal, of abandonment? Can we endure the pain and suffering that seems undeserved? How can we? Except with trust in the one who shared our human condition to the full. Because ultimately there is no satisfying intellectual action, uh, reasons for the problem of pain and suffering. Except maybe this, to tenderize us and teach us to bear it courageously. Brothers and sisters in faith, let us go to Christ, our high priest, 
the true prophet, the kindly king in our time of need. Those words to Hebrews invite us to such a stance before him. The author wrote, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. And I can't help but think of our patron, St. John Cardinal Newman, who penned the following prayer, which so embodies vocation, discipleship amidst suffering, and hope of eternal life. Uh, Jim Dryden prepared bookmarks of that coming into Mass. There's also some eight and a half by 11s that I brought with me. But I came upon this recently. I'd like to pray this. This is written by our patron. God knows me and calls me by name. God has created me to do him some definite service. He has committed some work to me which he has not committed to another. I have my mission. I never may know it in this life, but I should be told it in the next. Somehow I am necessary for his purposes. I have a part in this great work. I am a link in a chain, a bond of connections between persons. He has not created me for naught. I shall do good. I shall do his work. I shall be an angel of peace, a preacher of truth in my own place, while not intending it, if I do but keep his commandments and serve him in my calling. Therefore, I trust him. Whatever, wherever I am, I can never be thrown away. If I am in sickness, my sickness may serve him. In perplexity, my perplexity may serve him. If I am in sorrow, my sorrow may serve him. My sickness or perplexity or sorrow may be necessary causes of some great end which is quite beyond us. He does nothing in vain. He may prolong my life. He may shorten it. He knows what he is about. He may take away my friends. He may throw me among strangers. He may make me feel desolate, make my spirits think, hide the future from me. Still, he knows what he is about. Let me be thy blind instrument. I ask not to see. I ask not to know. I simply to be used. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.